Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Shomadeep Shamui. I am the coordinator of the School of Astrophysics Specialty University. Let me welcome all of you to this uh, hybrid mode of uh, Pavinari, which is just a lecture series on eminent women scientists. It's just to uh, encourage younger generation for that, for the researcher. And it, it has been organized by the uh, Gender in Physics Working Group of IPA. And this is the second lecture in that series. So without uh, any further delay, let me invite uh, Professor Vandana Nanal of uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research to introduce to you Pavinari. Professor Nanal, please. Uh, I can't see Vandana here. Yes. Uh, she got distracted. Just wait for a... Just we are checking for her connection. Yes, Professor Nanal, please introduce yeah. the webinar. I'm back. Sorry about the disturbance. Somehow I just lost the connection. Please go ahead with the introduction to the webinar. Thank you. you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm sorry for the technical hitch. So uh, let me extend a very warm welcome on behalf of uh, gender group of IPA to this Pavinari Colloquium series. Indian Physics Association was founded in 1970 with a goal to facilitate interactions among the physics community within India and uh, also uh, bring the information about latest developments in the field to the wider community. As many of you know, the gender problem in gender inequality problem in STEM and in physics in particular is very acute globally and India is no exception. So the sustained efforts of many senior women physicists who had to uh, struggle against many odds have led to the establishment of gender in physics working group of IPA in 2017. This purpose of this uh, group is to uh, provide a forum, a platform to address and voice the, and address the concerns, try to deliberate and find the solutions, increase awareness, promote best practices, promote mentoring of the young aspirant women physicists. This is achieved through various activities um, like workshops, lecture series, the sessions in the panel discussions in the symposia national and international meetings. We also liaise with uh, international counterparts like APS and AAPPS, particularly on the gender awareness issues. One of the major uh, programs of the gender group was uh, in 2019, we had a first national conference where the physicists and social scientists came together to deliberate this was Pressing for Progress 2019 was held in University of Hyderabad. And I'm very happy to see Professor Bindu Bamba who led this effort by present today's lecture. The, uh, 
the uh, effort, the very serious efforts of Professor Bindu Bamba and Professor Prajwal Shastri, who were the uh, main spearheads behind this uh, conference PFP 2019. Uh, led to the uh, culmination of Hyderabad Charter, which is uh, several guidelines for achieving gender equity. And we hope this will really uh, be not just a dream, but a reality in India. So another point to uh, which uh, Gender in uh, Physics Working Group or GIPWG has sort of working on right now is we, with the lead from GIPWG, we will be hosting IUPAP sponsored International Conference on Women in Physics, 8th International Conference online in July 23. I will give the uh, some of these links to these activities in the chat later. But as a, it's really a matter of pride for us that we will have this conference in India and we hope this opportunity will go a long way in furthering the cause of gender equity in India. As a warm-up, to this conference and or using this conference as an opportunity, we launched this uh, colloquium series, Pavinari. This is a kind of an extension of an IPA colloquium series, but here uh, that every month we will have one talk and we'll try to recapitulate or remember because there have been many, many women physicists whose fantastic work has been forgotten. They never received enough florals and a major cause for all this was that they were women. So with this series, we hope to cherish their work, bring to you and lead to more, give more visibility to their work. Uh, as a, This is the second lecture in the series. The first one was given in uh, December by Professor Prajwal Shastri on Anamani. Today, we are going to hear about stellar woman from Dr. Suchetna Chatterjee, who was the member of the first JIPWG and during 2017 to 20, 2020. So I'm very happy that uh, she is giving us this talk today. And we, of course, are very thankful to Presidency University for organizing this talk for Gender and Physics Working Group. So over to the organizers, and I look forward to this stellar talk. Uh, thank you, Professor Nadal, for your kind introduction. And I think it's a very good initiative by uh, the Gender Equality Group, and I wish a very success of the same. Without further delay, let me introduce today's speaker, who is uh, Dr. Suchetana Chatterjee, who is my dear colleague as well as friend. So Dr. Suchetana Chatterjee was an uh, undergraduate student of Arnsweil Presidency College, which is now the Presidency University here. Then she went to uh, IIT Kanpur for her master's degree, and actually she was my batchmate there. After that, she went to the uh, University of Pittsburgh for her PhD work. And from there, he went to Yale University as well as in the University of uh, uh, <coughs> Wyoming, where she was a postdoc for three years total in, and then four years, sorry. And then in 2013 on November, She's joined in the Presidency University here. And from for the last almost uh, nine years, we are, she's my colleague as a faculty in the Presidency University. So she works on many fields of astrophysics and cosmology, including uh, structure formation, in body simulation, uh, active galactic nuclei then feedbacks, all related stuffs, and in which she has published more than 20 uh, national and international papers. She has attended quite a lot of uh, national and international conferences. She is also a member of the Indian uh, Astronomical Society as well as the Astronomical 
uh, International Astronomical Union. And recently she has got the Dinobandhu Shahu Memorial Award in 2020 by the IAPT. So without further any delay, let me invite Dr. Suchetana Chatterjee for delivering this second lecture. Bajina. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Shomodik, uh, for such a kind introduction. And it is also quite emotional for me that to you know give this lecture at Princeton University, where as Shomodik was saying that I have been serving for nine years, and get introduced by a very dear colleague and friend. And also <clears throat> many thanks to IPA and particularly Professor Vandana Nanal and Professor Shubhavati Goswami for giving me this opportunity to talk about the work of these women. I mean, I, I will see how much justice I can do to deliberate the fantastic work that they did and the context in which we are doing this colloquium series that is unappreciated work yet, you know, not getting so much recognition, but yet doing tremendous contribution. So, <clears throat> so, and um, so let me now then share my slides. Uh, and so is it okay if I stop the video or should I keep the video on? If, if there's no bandwidth issue, try to keep it on. Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. So let me now share my slides. So can people see my slides? Yes. Okay. And okay, great. So, <clears throat> and uh, yes, also again, as I said, that it's really a proud privilege for me to talk in this second Pavinari lecture series. And the first was, as Professor Nanal said, given by Professor Prajwal Shastri, who is also one of my mentors. And she's the one who got me to GIPWG and has done tremendous work as Professor Nanal said. So it's definitely a proud privilege that I'm getting to speak on the same platform. Okay, so again, before just the talk, I just want to advertise one slide with what already Professor Nanal said. This is about the ICWIP, the International Conference on Women in Physics. So in 2017, <clears throat> so it was Prajbal Shastri's initiative she invited me to be in the Equip Indian team that was in 2017 that was held in Birmingham. And I was part of the Indian team accompanying Professor Shastri and, and, several, other, and several others accomplished uh, physicists. Uh, all of them were women in our team. And it was a, like a mind blowing experience. I'll just show one photograph later from that conference to see that uh, physicists and mostly women uh, from like very, very remote countries. I mean, countries where we hear that there is bombing going on and all that from Sudan and Afghanistan or, <clears throat> you know, Nigeria, all these people coming together for a conference. And it was really encouraging to see that they are putting their efforts despite all odds in their own countries to, you know, to drive their passion for physics and astrophysics and phys yeah, physics in general. So that was a fantastic experience for me. And now it's really, really a proud privilege again and a great honor that this year India got to host the conference. And, uh, and that was led by, mostly led by Professor Bandana Nanal and Professor Shubhavati Goshami. Due to their leadership, uh, we did get the you know, host status. So we were, we were awarded uh, the status of hosting this eighth uh, equip. And so I, encourage all of you who are in the audience today to go and look at this website and there is a registration that's going to probably start on the 15th. So all of you who are interested, please be there, please visit the website and also get in touch with me if you have questions. So your participation would be highly appreciated, okay? And this is mostly the initiative uh, from IPA. Great. So, <clears throat> 
Now, before I start the science, so, so now the scientific content of today's talk. And uh, so I'll just show you this picture uh, of everybody. I think there are most, I think all of the students who are in the audience have taken astrophysics courses with me or are doing research in astrophysics. And everybody is familiar with the Hubble's law, right? So that tells us that distant galaxies are moving away from us. The receding velocities are proportional to the distance from them. This is something that we do in the first lecture in cosmology. And this law came in 1926. So now uh, you have to, this is like a trailer. So you have to wait and see that why I brought Hubble in the first page and in the first slide of my talk, because that will be clearer maybe a few slides later. But all of us know about the Hubble law. Now it's called the Hubble Lemaitre law. And the great implication of this law was that it told us that the universe is expanding and eventually uh, we came to the Big Bang paradigm. So it's such an important and useful law in cosmology. Now the next one, this is also all the students are completely familiar with and many of you just had your final exams. So you must have studied hard. This is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which tells us about stellar classification. So there's a main sequence line, there is a main sequence line and all kinds of stars. We have giants and dwarf stars. And this, uh, this uh, classification, this uh, uh, this is a color magnitude diagram for stars in the universe. I shouldn't say universe, uh, stars uh, that was visible. And these are the two astrophysicists who are responsible for coming up with this uh, classification that we call HR. So this is, uh, I, I cannot pronounce the first name, uh, some Argent Hartsprung. So he was probably a Swedish, or I think a Danish astrophysicist. And then the second one here is Henry Norris Russell, who was at Princeton for a long time and a very well-known astrophysicist. And they are credited for the HR diagram. And this is again something that all of us learn in our first lecture or you know, maybe first few lectures when we try to understand stars in the universe, okay? So just keep, it, keep that two things in mind, the Hubble's law, that is the first thing in cosmology we learned. This is the HR diagram. One of the most important things that we learned when we study uh, stellar spectra or stellar classification. Now, uh, we will enter to the main content of the talk uh, because if you remember, the uh, title of my talk says Harvard's computers. This is computers. Uh, when we talk about computers, we have these machines in mind. Of course, I, I did not put any machine in the in the first slide, rather we can see some human beings, uh, mostly women, uh, and the legacy of the stellar woman. So, so you will see what is the connection with the Hubble's law and HR diagram that are just put up because they are so fundamental to studies of astrophysics. Now here in the next slide, so now we will move back. Those are just textbook physics things that we study. Now we will just go back in history. This is the late 19th century. And uh, I think this picture was probably in some, sometimes in the 1860s. This is a picture of something called the Harvard College Observatory. So the Harvard College Observatory was an observatory that was associated with Harvard University. And it was established in 1839. And then uh, like 10 years down the line, since the 1850s, there were very significant astronomical observational work that went on in the HCO, which is the Harvard College Observatory. And uh, <clears throat> now uh, the gentleman who you are seeing in this picture, his name is Edward Charles Pickering. So he was a professor at, uh, well, associated with Harvard University and was an astronomer and the director of the Harvard College Observatory from 1877 to 1919. So Edward Pickering, it turns out that Edward Pickering had an astronomer brother who was a professor at MIT. So a really very distinguished family of astronomers and both him and his brother did uh, some very, very important work in you know, gathering stellar spectra and also, you know, 
studying variable stars. So it turns out that uh, at the same time, there was a gentleman, he was a doctor and an amateur astronomer, uh, and also not only just an amateur astronomer, he also did uh, scientific work, but he was uh, professionally a doctor. I think uh, he was also linked with MIT. Uh, his name was <clears throat> Dr. Henry Draper. And uh, not only that, he was an astronomy enthusiast. He had a whole dream. He was very interested in astrophotography and you know, photographing the sky, I mean, taking images of the sky. And he wanted uh, to build a catalog, uh, which was later called the Henry Draper catalog. And he was very invested in this work. Now, his wife, uh, her name is uh, Anna Draper. I think there is a middle name or there's a first name, Anna, Anna something Draper, Anna Draper. Now, Anna Draper also accompanied her husband a lot in the astrophysics work. She was also astronomical work and she was also very engaged to it. Now, it turned out that uh, very suddenly uh, in an illness at the age of 45, Dr. Henry Draper uh, passed away. And so he did not have children, whereas his wife was a very wealthy heiress. So she, uh, his, uh, Henry Draper's father-in-law had real estate business. And so Anna Draper had a lot of property that she inherited from her dad and also uh, some from her husband. But Anna Draper was a very, very enthusiastic woman and uh, very enterprising. So she, what happened is that she uh, lost her husband at a very early age, but she had all the intention to work for her her husband's passion. So she also wanted to have these astronomy research that uh, Henry Draper had in mind to keep on with that work. And at that time, uh, they were very well connected with the astronomy community in the New England, in the Boston area, and also beyond. So she got in touch, Anna Draper got in touch with uh, Charles Pickering. In fact, Charles Pickering, Edward Pickering got in touch with Anna Draper and said that you know, uh, I'm very, uh, I'm very honored to tell you that I was a great fan of Henry Draper, and I want to continue with his work. And I have this uh, whole idea of uh, actually creating a very big catalog of stars, uh, and I want to do these observations through the Harvard College Observatory. So it would be nice if we can correspond in that matter. And this is a letter that uh, Henry Pickering, sorry. Edward Pickering wrote to Anna Draper, this is in May 17, 1885, I'm making plans for a somewhat extensive piece of work in stellar photography in, in which I hope that you may be interested. And then they corresponded and had all this funding and plan for having, doing these observations and creating this massive catalog. Now, it turns out that uh, what Edward Pickering had in mind is that uh, he, he thought that, okay, there will be a lot of data to process. Already it was, it was happening a little bit in the Harvard College Observatory, but the idea was that uh, what Pickering needed is that, okay, we can gather the data. So they had also a telescope in Peru. The Harvard College Observatory also had a telescope in Peru to look at the southern sky. But then he, he envisioned that, okay, we'll have all this data. But then who are going to, I really need human resource to sort of extract this data and, you know, find information from it. And then uh, this was the first thing that he had in mind that I need a very big team for the data analysis. And the second he thought was that, okay, this is Mrs. Anna Draper. She's the, she and there, there were some other people who are the funders of his project. So to please them, and also he had sort of a liberal mind at the time. Uh, he wanted uh, to employ women for this work. And the reason, the first reason he wanted to employ women is because women could be very lowly paid or unpaid because these are housewives or very educated women who don't have other jobs, but you can pay them really less or not pay them at all. And then you can hire a big, big group. If I don't have to pay, then I can, or I have to pay very less, then I can hire a lot of people. So that's the first cause. And the second was that he wanted to please Anna Draper, that look, your money is going in educating women or liberating women. So that adds a value to the money that you are putting, not just your husband's dream, not just science. It also adds to this social value. 
And so uh, <clears throat> what Edward Pickering did is he hired a group of women and they were called computers and not astronomers. That is the, I think that is the real tragedy of the whole story that uh, they did astrophysical observations and made, fan and made fantastic discoveries, but they were termed as computers. So these are people who will just handle the data. They don't do the observations. The observations were done by men because you have to stay all night, stay awake all night. That was very, very taboo in the 19th century for women to stay all night and do astronomical observations that was not common. So men did that work. And in the daytime, these women were called computers who would analyze the data, okay? Now, it turns out that Harvard College Observatory uh, began hiring women assistants as early as 1875. And these were the first four people, Rebecca Rogers, uh, Rhoda Saunders, Anna Winlock, and uh, this uh, woman, Wilhelmina, Wil Wilhelmina Fleming. So I'll, I'll talk about her. They were sort of the first four people who were hired by Edward Pickering's team to deal with the astronomical data. Now, this, uh, uh, this lady, Williamina Fleming, I have to mention about because she had tremendous contribution. Uh, so Williamina Fleming was actually a Scottish immigrant. So she came from Scotland, she migrated to the United States and she was a single mother. She had a child to support because her husband abandoned her. And she started working in Pickering's house as a housemaid. And at that time, Pickering had some assistants at HCO. They were all male assistants. And one day Pickering got very angry with the inefficiency of his assistants and said that, so you are all stupid folks. You can't do a piece of work. My maid, my Scottish maid can do better calculations and better work than you. He was so angry. And then uh, Pickering's wife suggested that, why don't you hire her? She, she's working as a housemaid because she had to support her son, but she had education and all that. She was a very young, single mother immigrant in the United States. He said, she's very, very smart. Because Mrs. Pickering told to Edward Pickering that she's very smart. Why don't you hire her as a computer in your observatory? So that's how uh, uh, Wilhelmina Fleming uh, was hired at HCO. And uh, this is the legacy of her work. Today, I'll not talk a lot, a lot about her work. So Fleming discovered 10 nova, 52 nebulae, and 310 new variable stars. Huh. She was also credited with being the first person to see the Horshed Nebula in 1888. So all these observations were done by Wilhelmina Fleming, and she was called Mina Fleming. And she got a lot of accolades in HCO and beyond for her work. Now it turns out that all this information, most of this information I have taken from the Harvard uh, archives. Now it turned out that between 1875 to 1975, 1975 is a very typical number. I would say up to maybe 1940s, uh, this was relevant. There are records of around 250 women working as astronomy computers. So these are computers, okay, at the Harvard College Observatory. Now, this is a very nice picture, which I got from the Harvard archives. I'm not sure how much you were able to see. So this is actually a typical office room. Uh, this is in the late 19th century. And this lady sitting in the center is Anna Draper. She's the funder. So she's the uh, project, she's funded the project. And these are all these, uh, several of these computers who are surrounding her. And I think this lady who's standing here, is Mina Fleming, Wilhelmina Fleming. So, uh, uh, so I like this picture. And then this is another picture. There are many such pictures. If you go to the website or look at the Harvard archives, there are very nice pictures of these uh, observatory pictures in the <clears throat> 19th, 19th century. And here, what you see is this is Edward Pickering. And these are some of the women, not the whole team, a lot of these women acted as computers and this photograph was taken uh, in front of the Harvard College Observatory, uh, I think sometimes in the 1890s. Okay, so today uh, I will mostly focus on the work of two such computers. The uh, first uh, person is Annie Jump Cannon. Uh, some of you might have, must, might have heard her name if you have studied astrophysics. 
So Annie Jamkhanan, she was a graduate uh, from uh, the Wellesley College. That was, so at that time, all this Radcliffe College, Wellesley College, Vassar College, many such college, and some of them were all women college. These are prestigious, very elite women college because some of you might not know the Ivy Leagues that we understand, um, I mean, the, that we call like Harvard or Yale, uh, they, uh, in their undergraduate program, they were too elite to include women in their program. They actually, Yale, for example, had women in their undergraduate program in the 1960s. So women were not allowed. Uh, so <clears throat> all these histories were there, but at least there were a lot of people uh, in the New England area and all over the United States that, okay, we need uh, women to get into higher education and all these very elite women colleges were coming. So Annie Jam Cannon, she was a student of Wellesley College and she studied uh, physics and astronomy there. In fact, uh, she uh, was mentored uh, by a female physicist who was also a student, former student of Edward Pickering. So, uh, and then uh, she also had a master's degree in astronomy from the uh, from Harvard, from the, from the Radcliffe College. Now, Annie Jump Cannon's uh, legacy is that uh, she played the, the HR diagram that I showed you and this O, B, A, F, G, all kinds of stars that you call uh, that the, the, the major, major part of that work was done by Annie Jump Cannon. I'll tell you how she did that stellar classification using glass plates using photograph this is what is it called this, yeah the glass plates the photographic glass plates and acting as a computer and did this entire stellar classification that we study today but of course uh, the diagram that we saw that's called hr diagram named after these two famous astronomers and well annie cannon actually got recognition later in her life as we'll see now she, for example, she was the first female honorary doctorate from Oxford University and was the first elected woman officer of the American Astronomical Society. But we'll see that these all accolades, these all prestige or recognition came much later in her life. And as you can see, she passed away in 1941. So she had a 44 year long career at the Harvard College Observatory and at that time, of course, Harvard or any other university did not permit women to, to be in regular faculty position. For example, this all women university colleges like uh, Wellesley or Radcliffe, they had women faculty, but Harvard did not have a woman full professor or full faculty because that was not allowed. Women were not allowed to hold a regular uh, faculty position. So this was, uh, so she stayed as a staff astronomer for a long time and just in 1930, which is right before her retirement and al almost a couple of years before her death, you can imagine, after having such a long career, she was appointed as the William C. Bond astronomer at Harvard University. So what was, and the other thing that is important is that Annie Jump Cannon also, she had scarlet fever and she was deep lifelong, so she couldn't hear. So somebody who was deep, and uh, stayed in an observatory for 44 years and did such outstanding work, which is uh, classifying stellar spectra by eye. This is unbelievable. Now, uh, as I said that she studied uh, astronomy and physics in Wellesley College and this lady, Sarah Frances Whitting was her mentor in, in Wellesley. Now, uh, she joined, I think in the, uh, I think some sometimes in 1891 or 1890, Pickering hired her as one of the computers at Harvard, and this is her work. So this is a picture of the one of the glass plates, and here are some amazing numbers. So in this is 1898, Cannon discovered her first star. So this star was not known before. Cannon looked at the glass plate uh, pictures and identified the star. That was 1898. At the beginning, she was able to classify 1,000 stars in three years. So that is the rate the computer could perform at the trade that in three years, you classify 1,000 stars. How was this classification done? So if you see, uh, I don't know, it's much not visible, but you can see these smeared lines. 
right? Now, these are all in grayscale. Now, if you, if you really had some, you know, color scale, color scheme, then these smeared gray lines will look somewhat like this inset box, which is actually a spectrum, okay? Now, what Annie John Cannon did is, she looked at the glass plate manually and looked at those small patches. So this is important for the graduate students, also all the students, that how hard can someone work that all their life they can't hear and looking at glass plates and looking at those gray, gray, this gray smudge, uh, kind of this diffused uh, lines and then classifying stars that which ones can be called, can be put into which group, okay? So using magnet, so she used, of course, magnifying glasses and that actually affected her eyesight a lot because she was doing like tremendous amount of work. So by 1913, this is, you can see 15 years. So with her 15 years experience, she was able to work on 200 stars an hour. So she looks at a glass slit for an hour and identifies, well, this star will be an O star or a B star or a whatever star, I mean, according to her classification. So, uh, you know, because we did not have computers at that time, but this is the uh, unaccounted labor of people that led us to our understanding of stellar physics or stellar spectrum. So now this is a very interesting fact that I got from uh, uh, the Harvard College archive where uh, Annie James Garden's work was discovered that using magnifying glasses, she could classify stars down to the ninth magnitude around 16 times fainter than the human eye can see. So she looked and looked and with magnifying glasses, she so these are very faint stars and she developed that i don't know i mean how somebody develops that kind of skill but somehow um, wherever i read about annie jump and everybody says that she was extremely disciplined extremely committed and extremely passionate about what she was doing and and just imagine hour after hour after hour looking at glass plates all through the day and classifying stars so that's very very that's a great thing that, uh, you know, definitely touches my heart. I'm sure it touches your hearts also. Now, as you know, all of you or many of you know that the stellar classification came, scheme, O, B, A, F, G came. By the way, with one, this, uh, this uh, gendered mnemonic about O, B, A, fine girl, all that thing, that was actually devised by Annie Jump Cannon. So uh, it was, she, so it was a woman who developed this, I mean, Later, that mnemonic was uh, hugely <laughs> criticized for being very sexist, but uh, the person who developed that mnemonic was actually Annie Jump Cannon. She used to tell the woman, because all her colleagues were women, so that's why she used to be a fine girl, because those are her colleagues at the Harvard College Observatory. Now, our scheme was based on the strength of the Balmer absorption lines. I mean, if somebody tells me even to look at the spectrum and find out like the strength of the Balmer absorption line in a computer screen, I don't think I'll be able to do that. And this amazing person was looking at glass plates and looking at those gray patches and from there identified the strength of Balmer absorption lines to classify a star. And uh, these absorption lines were sort of calibrated theoretically based on the temperature of the star. So she also devised the classification scheme of how the spectral type uh, can be related to the surface temperature of the star. And you can immediately, all of you who know about the HR diagram can immediately connect that that is mostly, mostly not fully, the physics of the Hartsprung Russell diagram that we, we know the names of these two people, uh, Annie Jump Cannon. Uh, I know that many astronomy books talk about the work of Annie Jump Cannon, but definitely she never in her lifetime, or at least majority of her lifetime, got no recognition that is anyway comparable to what her colleagues like Russell, because Russell was a very respected astrophysicist at Princeton University, and she was just a mere. Harvard computer who was working with uh, Edward Pickering. And uh, if some of you have read my abstract, it says that they were, these all these women, this whole team was termed as Pickering's harem. So harem means sort of like 
you know, slaves who are working sort of like that. Yeah. So great. Now, this is another aspect that uh, people really, really appreciated about Annie John Cannon, and that was she was very enterprising and networking. So she was very nice. She always tried to invite a lot of people to HCO. And this is taken again from the Harvard College archives. This is a visitor roster. And you can see 1935. This was when Annie Jump Cannon was pretty old. This is June 19th to June 21, Dr. Albert Einstein. So uh, I actually got the whole roster. Some king came. And so this, this also happened that uh, with Annie Jump Cannon's enthusiasm, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. No, she had her honorary doctor with Annie Cannon's Annie Jump's enthusiasm and enterprising spirit. She used to invite a lot of visitors both for intellectual interaction, for networking, for mentoring the younger people in the Harvard College Observatory, uh, uh, which actually made the environment very lively and very, and, and people tried for, you know, all the great work that came out of it. So she was also very well known for treating her staff and colleagues very, very nicely and having a very dynamic and intellectual environment at the observatory because Edward Pickering, I think he passed away. Uh, Edward Pickering passed away a few years after, I think 1921 or 22, I don't remember, is when Edward Pickering passed away. And then uh, uh, it was Annie Jump Cannon who was uh, almost in charge of the observatory. And she even took the role that Pickering took is not only did she do did the work, she actually, engaged a lot of people and got extraordinary work out of them. So it's not just uh, scientific work or observational work, it's also her leadership and mentorship that was uh, very, very well regarded. Uh, and as I said, as we are always saying, that that hardly got uh, much recognition in her lifetime. Okay, so this is, as I saw, this is an example plate. And uh, uh, so now in May 9th, 1922, uh, that was roughly like 30 years after Annie Jam Cannon worked on stellar classification, the International Astronomical Union formally adopted Cannon's stellar classification. As you know, that's, that's, that, that used to be called the Harvard classification. And that's the standard classification of stellar spectra that exists still today. So that's what we study, the, the works of Annie Jam Cannon and some of her colleagues. Great. Now the second work is another amazing lady. Her name is Henrietta Swan Lovett. So she was, um, she was, so it's both Annie Jam Cannon and Henrietta Lovett, they were born in America. Now uh, they were Americans. And so Henrietta Lovett, this is also a very interesting story. Uh, she, it is amazing that Annie Jam Cannon had this deafness. She had this lifelong disability. And Henrietta Levitt was born as a fine child, but later in her life, she also had scarlet fever and she lost her hearing. Also, she had enormous like eyesight problems because of the tedious work that she did at Harvard. Now, her work is fantastic. She was a graduate from the Radcliffe College. And this is what is written about her, that she graduated in June, 1892, receiving a certificate but she was very good at academics and got very good grades stating that, so the certificate stated, this is the certification that was given to Henrietta Lovett that if she had been a man, she would have qualified for a BA. So if she would have gotten a bachelor's degree and not a certificate had she been a man. So that was because I don't know what, where this came from and what was the, you know, bottle, what was the, ballpark of how you evaluate people. But I think what it means is that we are appreciating your effort because you have done so well. It's almost as good as a man could have done. I think that's what the certification actually means. And as I said, she also dealt with hearing disability. Now she is, uh, she discovered, so something called the Cepheid variables. This is a variable star. So uh, Henrietta Levitt worked with lots of Cepheid variables. And not only that, she discovered a very fundamental relation uh, 
uh, that existed in in the in this Cepheid variables is this, this this particular variable star, and that is called the period luminosity relation. So Henrietta Leavitt was the discoverer of the period luminosity relation, and as you will see, that she actually proposed the first standard candle in astronomy. Now, those of you who did my cosmology class, we have a lot of discussions about standard candles. It turned out that Levitt's work was the first work in the history of astronomy, which gave us the idea of standard candles and how they can be used as distance indicator in astrophysics and cosmology. Now, uh, Henrietta, so Annie Jam Cannon was also a bachelor and Henrietta Levitt was also a bachelor. So of course, you can imagine that having such a strong disability, it's, it's a little hard to have uh, family and all that stuff. So they devoted, uh, almost they were completely devoted on the work they were doing at Harvard College Observatory. Now, this is 1921. This is also interesting. I'll come to her work in a few minutes. So she was born on July 4th, 1868. She was five years younger to Annie John Cannon. And she passed away in 1921. This was at a very early age, at the age of 53, uh, due to stomach cancer. But uh, Levitt really did not get recognition. Now, Annie Jam Cannon's, the difference between Henrietta Levitt and Annie uh, Jam Cannon was that Annie Jam Cannon was very enterprising. And uh, she also came from a much more illustrious academic family. Uh, her, her dad was uh, a very well known. So she was very enterprising and she would go out, meet people. So she still got much more recognition uh, compared to somebody like Levitt, who was a very quiet person. And she came from a Jesuit family. So her family was uh, priests. They were priests. So she comes from a Jesuit family and she was a very quiet person. And you can see this is really uh, in a heartbreaking to see that Levitt was made head. This is the uh, probably the highest level of recognition that Henrietta Levitt got. Levitt was made head of stellar photometry at the Harvard College uh, Observatory. This was in 1921, just a few months before she passed away. So before death, before she passed away, she was made, she was given this recognition that due to your work, we made you the head of the stellar photometry division at the Harvard College Observatory. Now, this is nice. So it turned out that Levitt was first hired by Pickering. And then she did some work on variable stars. Pickering asked her to do work on variable stars. So she did some work on that. And then with her family, she went to a true tour to Europe um, and spent some time there. So I think a few years, two, three years, she worked and then she moved to Europe. And then she figured out that uh, uh, this is what she really wants to do is work at the Harvard College Observatory and get involved in the work that Professor Pickering offered her. And so this is a very nice letter that Levitt writes to Pickering. I would like to read the letter because this shows, this gives us some insight. I'm more sorry than I can, so I'm, I'm more sorry than I can tell you that the work I, <clears throat> this is Levitt's right, that the work I undertook with such delight and carried to a certain point with such keen pleasure should be left uncompleted because before going to Europe, she was working on a draft and the draft couldn't be finished. So Pickering was pushing her that finish the paper, finish the paper. She couldn't, uh, she couldn't finish the paper and she went for her travels. So that's what she's referring to in the first lines. I apologize most sincerely for not writing concerning the matter long ago. I'm having some trouble with my hearing, worrying a little oddly that stargazing might make it worse. My friends say, and I recognize the truth of it, that my hearing is not nearly as good when absorbed in astronomical work because of the cold seasons, you know, and because you, the, the Harvard New England area is a very cold area and this tedious work. So that used to also affect both her eyesight and her ears because she uh, suffered from scarlet fever. Cold weather seems to aggravate my condition. It is evident that I cannot teach astronomy in any school or college where I should have to be out with classes on cold winter nights. My orist, uh, the people who had taken, looked, looked at her like, uh, so you understand. My orist forbids any such exposure. Do you think it is likely that I could find employment either in an observatory or in a school where there is a mild winter climate 
is there anyone besides yourself to whom I might apply? So she writes this letter from Europe to uh, Pickering for his mentorship that can you advise if there are some other jobs that I can take up? Because I, am, I really enjoy astronomy, but these are some of the constraints that I have. And then this is what Pickering, because Pickering was, uh, Pickering had very high regard for Levitt's work. Uh, so this is what Pickering writes. For this, I should be willing to pay 30 cents an hour. So, 30 cents, but this is 1902, 30 cents an hour in view of the quality of your work, although our usual price in such cases is 25 cents an hour. So, generally I pay 25 cents, but since you are so good at it, I would be willing to pay you 30 cents. And then later I read that correspondence and Levitt said that is so generous of you that instead of 25 cents, you are paying me 30 cents, okay? Uh, if, if it was not possible for you to relocate, I would pay your fare for a short visit to Cambridge. You could get work in order to take home to some, somewhere she did. I do not know of any observatory in a warm climate where you could be employed on similar work and it would be difficult to furnish you with a large amount of work that you could carry on elsewhere. In any case, I should doubt if astronomy had anything to do with the condition of your hearing, unless you have been assured that this is the case by good honest. So he wants to say, I don't think that you're astronomer. The, the reason he writes it that way is because he wants to convince her that come and work with me because he had so high regard for Levitt's work. And then eventually Levitt said that that's so generous of you. And she then again came and joined the Harvard College staff and started her work on variable stars. So <clears throat> this is an example of what Levy used to do, how she discovered the period luminosity relations in, uh, in, uh, in, in Cepheids. I think she looked at about 17, uh, around 2000 Cepheids. She studied the uh, periodicity and, you know, mag so they were looking at magnitudes. Let me, let me tell you what she did. This is not too much visible. This is actually Levitt's handwriting. She was writing. This is again from the Harvard College archives. Levitt gathered five images. So this is how she did the work. She Levitt gathered five images of a section of the sky from different nights. And then four of them were negatives, four glass negatives and one glass positive. Now, if it's a regular star, that means there is no variability, then the positives and negatives will superpose with each other because the positive is taken in one night. The other four negatives are taken in other nights. So if there is no change, then they will overlap with each other. This is her technique. She was a computer. And, but then if there is a variability, then what happens is it's not visible here, but you can go and look up uh, the Harvard College archives where these, some pictures of these glass plates are here. But when she superposed the negative with the positive for these, safe, for these variable stars, she could see that either there is a black region or a white region because they are not fully matching with each other, okay? So overlaid each negative in turn on the positive print and starts with constant brightness, neutralized, so there is no, no signature that you can detect, whereas stars which are variables, that means they are changing overnights, there you can see that there is a change. Now variables showed with white or black rings. This is from Sobel's book, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the reference. Now change, now this change in the small change. So then she marked like this, these are like circle. Do you see these black things that she's working on? So this is at, actually, this is a glass plate. This is at the behind, at the back side of the plate. She used to do these markups. And then with how much the diameter of this small circle is, with that, she made an estimate of the magnitude. So it's just a normalization problem. So that was, the diameter of the circle where, uh, where an estimate, so changes in the variable's brightness and its period are determined by comparing plates taken at the same section of sky on different dates through a magnifying glass, of course. The diameter at each night is an approximation of the brightness. So then you can see the diameter is a brightness. And then when you superpose, then you can see that, okay, in this interval, the brightness is changing by this amount. And that's what she did for hundreds and hundreds of variable stars. And then eventually, this is the tedious amount of work she did and eventually got the period luminosity relation. 
Now, Pickering assigned Levitt to study variable stars in the small and large Magellanic cloud. She identified 1,777 variable stars. And so she published her work first. She first published her work. Actually, Pickering published her work because Pickering was the professor and uh, she was just a computer, an assistant. So this came in 1908, but this is another paper, 1912. This, is a, uh, this was a circular from the Harvard College Observatory. So if you go to NASA ADS, you can download all this work of uh, Henrietta Levitt or Anjum Cannon. I got it from there. So this is the title of the paper, periods of 25 variable stars in the small Magellanic cloud. And you can see the first line, it says, the following statement regarding the periods of 25 variable stars in the small Magellanic cloud has been prepared by Miss Levitt. So that is the first line that uh, Edward Pickering writes in the paper saying that this is the work done by Miss Levitt, okay? But the paper was of course signed by uh, Edward Pickering. And then this is the table from that paper where the maximum and minimum uh, magnitude of those 25 stars. This is the table. This is the position and magnitude, all the things. And then this is the final plot that Henrietta Levitt came up with. So this is log log plot. So this is the, uh, the, the log of the period. And this is whatever she called magnitude. She took log of that. And then she reported to Pickering that, okay, if I look at the log log plot, both the maximum and the minimum, they tend to follow like a straight line. This uh, straight line fitting was also done by Levitt uh, by hand. And that's how the period luminosity thing that, okay, these Cepheids have a relationship between their periods and the luminosity. So then what, uh, what uh, now this is actually the last paragraph of the paper. As you can see, this is March 3, 1912 is when the circular came out and this is Edward Pickering signing. So only the reference to Levitt is in the first line that this has been reported by Levitt. At least even that was considered a great uh, acknowledgement because some would even not do that. Okay. The facts known with regard to this 25 variable suggest many other questions, etc. And then at that time, so these were all uh, Cepheid's variable stars in the large and small Magellanic cloud, or the, this is case, this is the large Magellanic cloud. At that time, the distance of the LMC was not known. So this was a proposal. This is fantastic that Miss Levitt made. She made the point that since all these stars are in the LMC, that means they are at the same distance from us. So then she said that if by any means we can know the distance, then we can find the luminosity of the Cepheids. And if we know the luminosity, because she was talking about magnitudes, if we can know the luminosity, then by using, later by using the period and we can calibrate the period luminosity relation, and that would give us a way to measure distance. So this was a claim that was made actually by Henrietta Levitt, and that is the concept of standard candles. So a year after Levitt published her work, this heart sprung, the same heart sprung from the HR diagram, determined the distance to the LMC, and this calibration was proposed. So once he measured, so the distance was measured through parallax measurements. So the LMC distance was measured by Hartsprung and some other groups. This was just a year later, this is 1913. And once the distance is measured, then you can calibrate your period luminosity relation. And then now you will come to why I showed Hubble's law at the beginning, Edwin Hubble, when he got this, famous Hubble's law, which gave birth to the concept of the knowledge, the idea of expanding universe, actually used Levitt's period luminosity relations of Cepheids to find out his data. So that's what he used. And then uh, the tragedy is that uh, I looked up at Edwin Hubble's 1926 paper, where he gave Hubble's law. That paper had around 960 citations. So I went to NASA ABS and uh, you can't see it, but there are like 13 references in Hubble's original paper. And none of those references were related to any of the papers that Levitt wrote. So the period luminosity relation that was originally discovered by Levitt and Pickering's group 
uh, were not referred, of course, or not referenced in the how this paper is a very big paper. I think it's a 40 page paper. I was surprised to see that Edwin Hubble wrote such a long paper, but the, this paper was not referenced there. But then uh, even, so I went and did some little more search and find out that it did not feature the 1912 paper or the 1908 paper. Although I have read, it is a rumor that it is believed that Hubble was very appreciative of Levitt's work. And she said, and he said that, oh, you know, this is a fantastic piece of work that Miss Levitt did. And I could uh, do all these beautiful measurements based on her data and her observations. But definitely that was not professionally, at least not recognized in his paper. This paper, Levitt's 1912 paper, which actually had the first plot of the period luminosity relation of sepias, got the first citation. This is again a ADS reference in 1982. So that was a 1912 paper, and that was first got a citation in 1982. That was way after Levitt passed away or Pickering passed away. In contrast to Hubble's paper, Hubble published his paper, the Hubble's law paper in 1926. That got its first citation in 1927. So one may think that, okay, you know, at those old days, people did not know, or there wasn't a culture of citing other people's work. That's not the case. People used to cite the work of accomplished people and others whom they did not think that, oh, it's not, we don't need much recognition for them. They ignored. So we'll come to that again. So that, uh, these are all like, knowledge for me. I did not know any of this information and I'm so glad that I looked it up and studied and thought and went through this just for this talk. So this was an eye-opening, uh, you know, feeling. Uh, this is, this was a fantastic, this was something that shook me. Great. And this is actually a picture of Levitt and Cannon again uh, in front of the Harvard College Observatory in one of the rooms. And as I said, both did fantastic work and they also has had like serious disability. That's, that's a coincidence. Now, finally, I'll just in one slide mention uh, this famous woman. She is even, she's even more regarded than, uh, much more regarded than Henrietta Levitt uh, because she, I think her most, because she uh, was credited to, uh, to do the work, to do actually the theoretical work using the Shaha ionization equation, Magnus Shaha's equation. So her name is Cecilia Payne, and Gaposkin is her uh, uh, her husband's last name. That's a fan, that's a very nice story that how she got married to a Russian a astronomer who was actually her assistant, but later uh, they they were in love and then they got married. That's a different story. But Cecilia Payne. She's a British, she was a British, a British physics, physics student. And then she was, she studied in Cambridge. And then she was very influenced by Arthur Eddington and wanted to do astrophysics research. But then she found out that the opportunities for a woman in England is severely restricted. So some of our mentors said that if you want to do science uh, as a woman, uh, America is not that great, but America is still better. Go to Harvard because you have this, because, you know, by that time, the legacy of the Harvard women were there, all these uh, universities, all these colleges were coming out. So go there. And then she traveled from England to America. So she migrated there and she came. And so at that time, when she came to uh, the U.S., she actually came to Harvard. So Harlow Shepley was, the, so after Edward Pickering, the next director was Harlow Shepley. So she came and, uh, you know, discussed with Harlow Shepley. And it turns out that uh, Cecilia Payne Gopskin, uh, I did, don't know if the pronunciation is right. She is the first uh, PhD student. So it's first woman PhD student from Harvard College Observatory. And her work was phenomenal because using the Shaha ionization, ionization equation, she showed that the stars, the sun is mostly composed of hydrogen and helium. And that was not the popular belief at the time people thought that the constitution of the earth and the sun are similar, but it was Cecilia Payne's thesis, which was first rejected by Henry Norris and Russell. So she, he was the examiner of Cecilia Payne's thesis. So he first rejected it, but then uh, there were arguments that, that that's still fine, rejecting a thesis. But then finally it was accepted that yes, 
what Cecilia Penn is proposing is the right thing, that definitely these stars are mainly composed of hydrogen and helium. So Cecilia Payne again stayed at the Harvard College Observatory and Harlow Shepley, who was also her PhD advisor, he actually mentored a lot. He was the one who inspired Cecilia to write the thesis. She said, you are brilliant, you should work on astrophysics research. Not only that, he went out all his way to find employment for Cecilia Payne at Harvard. And he, in fact, he did a lot of, you know, because he was influential. So he uh, did, he went out of his way and took a lot of efforts so that Cecilia can be appointed at Harvard as a regular faculty. And then it was Harlow Shepley and then Donald Menzel, who was also the director of HCO. Uh, finally, with their efforts, these two men mostly, uh, with their efforts, Cecilia Penn was promoted to a full professor at Harvard in 1956. So she was a professor at the Department of Astronomy at Harvard. And it turns out that she is the first female head of the department. So she headed the Harvard Astronomy Department and she was the first female head of the department uh, at Harvard, uh, Cecilia Penn. Now you can see that this legacy as Professor Vandana Nanal was saying that if you go and look at the statistics all over India, uh, this this segregation, I mean, the, the disparity in number between how many women are holding certain position, uh, let's say in physics, and how many men are holding certain positions in physics is still uh, not very encouraging. And these were the days like 60 or 70 years, 80 years back, you know, these are the people who first broke those ideas and, uh, you know, took to positions that were uh, not perfect perceived as the standard gender role uh, that was assigned to women. So I just made a very funny comment that presidency physics it is a 110 year old department. Uh, 1910 is when it was more than 110 years old. It only had, so right now we are four faculty members, four women. We had four women faculty in physics. And I think before that, maybe two or three more. So in its 110 year old history, presidency physics had only seven or eight uh, female faculty. Definitely nobody headed the department. So uh, we, we even could not, uh, you know, leave up to Harvard's legacy or any other legacies. This is a fun comment that I thought I should make. So now I think I'm coming to the end of the talk that as we saw that Pickering paid 25 to 50 cents per hour. And I went and looked up the employment rates at the time. Uh, and the sources that I looked up, it said that that was higher than a factory worker, but lower than a clerk. So with that wage, uh, they were hired and men would not do that work. First of all, they would not do that work because they would have better things to do rather than looking at a glass plate. And even if they looked at a glass plate, they would have to be paid like much more than 20, 25 cents or 30 cents. So that's the thing that to have a larger workforce, and the goodwill. Uh, this is what Pickering did. Now, I think the idea is that it's not, we are, we are talking about uh, this issue in the context of gender, but not just gender. I would make it more general that uh, whenever we have, uh, so, so it's, it's generally true when we have minorities or marginalized communities and we take things for granted. And since this is a power equation that when I have more power, I feel this entitlement that I don't need to recognize their work. Oh, you know, this is somebody who is at lower hierarchy than me. I can just tell them, hey, do this work for me. And I don't uh, accept or acknowledge or appreciate. I mean, maybe I appreciate, but I don't formally make this effort to professionally recognize that. So I think that's the uh, worst legacy. Now for women, it happens so much because women have been historically doing household work. So they were considered as homemakers, caregivers, and nobody ever pays somebody for, you know, looking after your child's clothes or, you know, you know cleaning your husband's, uh, I don't know, clothes or giving food to your children. I mean, people are not paid for that. So, so that's the entitlement that, okay, you know, women historically have been doing work where they just do it as a, you know, as a service, as, as somebody who's giving care. So it's okay to ask a woman and do some work for me as an assistant and not give, think 
think of them as equal. I think that's probably the idea rather than more like, you know, very conscious gender biasness or anything. Because Pickering was considered very progressive at that time. I mean, the very fact that he hired women was quite uncommon of his times. I mean, people used to laugh at male colleagues, used to like, hey, we have hired some, what do you do with this, all these women? That's why they used to jokingly say that Pickering's harem, yeah. So, <clears throat> no, this is the thing that I also want to say that we might, in today's standard, Pickering's work would be considered like exploitation, but that was not the case in the late 19th century. So Pickering allowed some women to make telescopic observations. In fact, any any cannon, any can, any jump cannon. She traveled to Peru. That was also unusual for a woman to travel from New England to Peru to do telescopic observations. So she actually went to the southern hemisphere to look at the sky, and she used to do even telescopic observations at the Harvard College Observatory. So and Pickering allowed that, although that was a taboo. But this was the exception rather than the rule. Mostly women were brought from producing real theoretical work and were instead, uh, they were thought as like uh, analyzing and reducing the photographs. These reductions, however, served as the statistical basis. Okay, so that's the idea. And I would just end that in 2008, November 2008, that was the, that was the 100 years after Levitt published her first paper on the Cepheid variables. Uh, that was in the 100th anniversary or 100th year, the American Astronomical Society, they had a meeting and their resolution was made. It was not forced, but because AAS doesn't have the power to force somebody to do a nomenclature, but AAS uh, had a resolution that from now on, the period luminosity relation that is being used it is recommended that that be referred to as Levitt's Law. So to give credit to the work that Henrietta Levy did, and Annie Chum Cannon, as I said, she was more enterprising and had a lot of leadership skills. So even within her the limited means and the circumstances, she could do much more than any of her other peers. And she was also very brilliant. So all of them are brilliant, but Annie was like really the very, very bright one among them. So at that time only, this was, I think, 1934, she, uh, she started a prize that was called the Annie Jump Cannon Award in Astronomy that was awarded by, that has been, that is still awarded by the American Astronomical Society. And the first awardee was Cecilia Penn. So in fact, it turned out that Annie wanted to give the award to Cecilia Penn for her fantastic thesis work and it was completely you know backed by Harlow Shefflin and even Henry Norris Nussel who was against Cecilia's thesis was actually at that time the chairperson of AAS. He also insisted that yeah this is a tremendous fantastic work done by Cecilia Penn so we should award her but that was an award that was given to a women astronomer. So that was 1934 and uh, Annie Jump Cannon Award started in American Astronomical Society and that was the first awardee was Cecilia Penn. And then we have gone a long way. I particularly want to show these pictures because these are personal anecdotes. So here, what you see in this picture, this is the Hyderabad meeting that Professor Vandana Nanal was talking about in 2019. And we had uh, Professor Meghuri and the second, the one here is Professor Bimla Bhuti. I can talk about Bimla Bhuti on some other day. She was a very noted plasma physicist. And, uh, in India, and her story is very inspiring. So, uh, Professor May Giri, who used to be uh, one of our mentors when I was a postdoc at Yale, and so Meg was given the Annie Jump Award in 1990. And this is uh, Professor Laura Kreitberg, who is now at IMPRS Germany. Uh, she was an undergraduate student when I was a postdoc, so she is the recipient of the Annie Jump Award in 2021. The reason I showed these two pictures is because. You see, we all are also connected with the history that created this legacy of the stellar woman. So even the Annie Jump Cannon Awards are being now, you know, awarded to our colleagues, mentors, and to our students. So uh, Laura was actually mentored by Arsisar. Uh, she used to work. She used to work in Arsisar's research group, and you know, you feel so great that the great works of these women in the 19th century or early 20th century is so much connected directly to our lives. And this is, so I was talking about that 169 
countries representing coming to ICW. I think this is, of course, not representation of 169 countries, but you know, maybe 30, 40 countries. This is a picture from the Birmingham meeting, and here I am. So I was part of the Indian team. And as I said, that it was inspiring to see that how people follow their passion, like we saw the stories of Annie Jam Cannon or Henrietta Levitt or William F. Fleming, uh, and you know, and fight through hard circumstances to follow what they really love and want to do. Great. And so I'll stop my talk here, in my talk here, and these are the references. And special thanks to Vandana Nana, Subhavati Goshami for giving me the opportunity. And uh, special thanks to Professor Ritavan Chatterjee for providing me a lot of the inputs based on which um, I prepared my talk. Uh, Monica Young and Shoga the Borat, Shoga the took that picture with me, Neg and Bimla Bhuti. And of course, Indian Physics Association for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. So now I think we can have some questions. Maybe. So uh, thanks a lot, Sujitana, for such a wonderful talk. And I guess young researcher must have been inspired with such talk. And I wish I could have I would have have the opportunity to listen to such kind of talk during my student life. Anyway, now it's time to question and session. So people who are watching it online in the YouTube, please write your comment or question in the chat box. Uh, people who are watching in the Zoom should raise their hand and I will ask you, give you the opportunity and also the audience should raise their hand. First, I will go to the uh, Zoom. Yeah. So Bindu yes. Yeah. I. I. It's not a question. I just want to add uh, two things. Uh, uh, you know that often Cecilia Payne Roboshkin is taken as a model for uh, uh, for eliminating many myths against uh, women uh, in in science. Then one of them in, was, as you as you said, the two uh, two women you mentioned earlier. They were bachelors. But Cecilia Bain Gaboshkin, she had three children yes. uh, during uh, you know, her most active years of research. So the myth that when women have children, they stop working was something that was completely blasted by Cecilia Bain Gaboshkin. So I think that is very important because that's a big myth that is still prevalent today. Yes. And yeah, and the second thing is that women don't get revolutionary ideas. That's another myth. Okay, they they just work on routine work. Now, Cecilia Payne Grabashkin's thesis was rejected because she said that stars were um, made out of hydrogen and helium mostly. And in those days, uh, I, I suppose yeah, the church's influence was still there because it was thought of that the earth and the, the sun were probably made out of the same material and, and, and it was imbibed by the scientists, this erroneous notion, and therefore her revolutionary idea that the, the, the stars were composed of something different from that of the earth was, you know, was revolutionary and therefore did not fit in the, the general stream. So she, you know, she, uh, she's given an example of banishing two myths against women. One is that creativity, creativity is not there and the other is that creativity is hampered by children. Yes. So this, this is what I want. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bamba. I think uh, she mentioned these two things that there was this myth that women can't be creative. They can only be taken for like routine work, like looking at glass plates. Cecilia Payne's thesis brought that, uh, it's like uh, broke that myth. And the second one was that you can have a fantastic research career, even if you are giving birth to children and having a family, because that's another thing that acted against having women in the workforce or in the scientific workforce, because, you know, uh, they will not be able to uh, be productive. Thank you so much, Bindu. So any other questions in uh, the Zoom? I don't see any hand raise in the Zoom as well as I don't see anything in the uh, YouTube live chat. Uh, but, uh, can I ask I, something? Can I, I must uh, make a comment. Okay. Yes, yeah, Shika, go ahead. Well, Shika, go ahead. Shika, please. Uh, yeah, so very nice uh, talk, uh, Suchetna, uh, really very impressive. I just wanted to 
uh, check uh, find out one thing so this kind of computers must be in other fields also is it or uh, was it something uh, just to uh, in the case of astronomy and astrophysics so yeah i also looked that up yeah in so of course that was later when when nasa yeah in nasa used to employ these computers for doing their calculations of rocket launching and all that so that you know there are you know books movies on that and there are like famous yeah, that, 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 yeah of course hidden figures is a very beautiful hidden movie figures. about that. so that's in the in, that's in the field of like uh, space science but i also a uh, little bit read that uh, even in biology at that time i don't know for looking at like plant tissue and all that people i don't know if they could be called computers because here they were really doing calculations they are probably they were not doing calculations but some kind of classification and all that people used to hire women but that must that might be interesting to see that yeah that will be very interesting to see ki what was going on in other fields also at the contemporary time yeah very very nice talk thank you thank you so much shikha so yes question unique yeah i also just wanted to say that i really enjoyed the talk and i hope uh, this will also be uh, very motivational to the students yeah which is it's nice yes thank you so much vandana yeah so there is a question yes from the audience So my question was that uh, first of all, that was a really fantastic and very much motivating talk right now in the middle of our semesters and exam pressures going on. So my question was that uh, in the adage of Kevin Scott, uh, where he showed those glass plates and those painted lines, does it signify only to the painted stars, or those lines have any other significance also? So those lines, apparently, as I understood, were like spectrum of stars. Now, if the star is faint, then of course the lines will be even fainter. So those blurry things are actually spectrum. So if you had a way to put filters and have colors then they would look like small patches of rainbows <laughs> rainbow so, so they were then fitted with the spectrum color uh, yeah so they so she could understand that this is red this is green and then find out the strength of absorption lines from those smudgy things just by observing by just by eye. eye just by eye that was really fantastic yeah thank you again for the great talk yes thank you स्टिकल fluctuation as error like we do you know repeat the experiments maybe i don't know but that is a possibility that definitely i am not sure how can somebody get the measurement error but it could be statistical that i do it once do it twice measure the diameter and then i take the statistical average and maybe the spread or something as the error or something that like we repeat experiments maybe this is my conjecture so one question from the youtube Okay, so what is the question from the YouTube? Uh, so, don't we have any Indian women contribution? It's from Rachana Singh. So the question is, uh, Indian women contribution in what? Yes, uh, mean in physics or in the computing of stellar uh, stellar spectra, stellar classification, or variable stars? This is specifically for the Harvard classification scheme, but yes, there are lots of. indian women who contributed tremendously in physics for example the first preliminary talk was about anna mani so she was an indian physicist working at arala is that your question okay yeah. Uh, there was also uh, viba choudhury about whom with this uh, talk will be there she was also one of the first women experimentalists okay. like, yeah, who so went into the kind of behind the memory yes. <laughs> yeah so there are quite a few in fact there was uh, i mean uh, beyond physicist if you talk about there was also dr kamla soni kamla soni yeah so there are many i mean you can name them but it's also uh, i mean we hope we will show this more of these actually a lot of them yeah so any other questions, questions?
Okay. okay. So, so uh, well, so it's so we are at the end of this uh, program. But uh, before the end, I should say one thing that uh, Suchetana did mention that in 110 years, we didn't have any women chair in the physics department. That's true. But I should say that School of Astrophysics has been established <laughs> because only the hard effort and complete, uh, complete dedication by none other than the Suchetana. <laughs> Without her, it would not be possible to establish that. School of Astrophysics. Oh, that's so kind of you. I don't think uh, one person can do anything, yeah. but yes, I'm I'm so thankful that... Complete leadership by heart. <laughs> okay. So, leadership among three people. <laughs> yeah, whatever you say. Anyway. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you all for listening to the talk and be here. So, we close it here now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank please. you for presidency for hosting it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So yeah. Now I'm ending the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vandana. Thank you, Sujetna. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.